Well, if you were here last week, we started a series called Extravagant. There's a few things that we want Christians to be extravagant in. And last Sunday, Pastor Yuri talked about extravagant faith. We are people of faith. A lot of times, people have a problem with that, and I always kind of, kind of give this example of going to the gym, and you find out that they have weights, and you walk in, and you're like, wow, I didn't know they have weights. No, it's a gym, right? Our faith requires exactly that, faith. And I hope that as a church, we take that seriously. Because you see, when we serve a God that is bigger than our, our mind and our imagination, there will be some mysteries that you'll never get a chance to understand. And you will just have to trust God on this, at least this side of eternity. So we hope as a church, and Pastor, you did an amazing job last Sunday talking about how as a, as a people of God, we are to have extravagant faith. And today I want to talk about extravagant love. The word uh, extravagant means something, when you go and splurge something more than you anticipated, that's being extravagant. When you go and buy gifts that you know you don't have money to buy, but you have to get that gift because you just want to be extra, that's extravagant. Okay? If you, uh, I don't know, sometimes if you get your pants stuck on the door handle, if you ever had that, not a pleasant experience, you know, you're being a little bit extra, right? Like, (laughs) Those moments, when you go and spend, you know, money at the mall, you come back with a lot of bags, and you're like, I didn't plan on this. You're being extravagant. Oh, I'm not here to tell you that we want you to go and spend a whole bunch of money you don't have. But as people of God, we are called to be extravagant in our love towards others. We are called to be extra and how we love one another, and how we are gentle, and how we are kind. Now, this is a sermon applies to me just as much as applies to all of you, so um, I'm going to lead with that. <laughs> um, Ephesians 2.1, if you have your Bibles, you can open up uh, that place. If you don't, I do believe we're going to have it on the screen. It's a little bit of a uh, lengthy passage, so just stick with me until verse 10, and it says this, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest But God, can somebody say, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, or transgressions rather, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourself. It is, not, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. What a beautiful passage. This is God being extravagant. While we were dead in our transgressions, God loved us. Different passage put it, when when we were God's enemies, God loved us. And he sent for us. You see, when we talk about being extravagant in our love, you can't give something you don't have. I think Thanksgiving is coming up and, 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 and Christmas is coming up. And if you have the tradition of giving gifts, you know, you're probably going to go and splurge and spend on the people that you love. But you see, 
to be extravagant in your love and your kindness and your gentleness, sometimes it's impossible. How do you become extravagant in your love and your gentleness when you are just angry? When something happened and you're like, man, I, I can't see right now, let alone be kind? It, it, it's, and here's the bad news. It's impossible. We are constantly going back to our old nature. When somebody crosses off, we blow up. If somebody didn't say hi to us, we take an offense. We, we are constantly doing this. This is signs that maybe the reason we cannot give something out is because we don't ourselves have it. I love how in John, there's this powerful passage in far, rather 1 John 4, 18 says this, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Why do we love? Because he first loved us. Now, after the sermon, you might get out and you're like, yeah, I got to love people. I mean, I, this, we got to do this. this is, let's do this. And then you're going to hit traffic. Probably not Sunday, but Monday morning for sure. If you're commuting, you know what I'm talking about. And you'll get to work. Your boss might not have the most kind of words to you. And then there's this thing just sort of builds up. And by the end of the day, you started out good. You started out, I want to go and love the world. I want to just love my neighbors and everyone. And like you started out with that. And by the end of the day, you're thinking like, I don't want to see anybody right now. I want to go watch Netflix and just eat ice cream because I really don't want to deal with anybody right now. And some of you deal differently. You are conf- some of you are confrontational and you just want to confront people and you just go and confront them. Let me tell you. And some of you are passive aggressive. You're like, uh, you know, and you just give them the, that, <laughs> that face, but you don't confront it. And that's how you deal with stuff. You know, where you just ignore the whole issue. And, and that's how we deal with, with things, right? Like, you see, you can't give something away that you don't have. We first, I mean, we love because what? He first loved us. I, I heard this analogy if that helps you take it. But basically, back in the day when they had wooden ships, and on the sea, obviously, it was very turbulent. And at times, when it was a storm, the captain always say, look at the horizon. Because if you look at the next wave, you will get sick. But imagine a ship deciding that they got to navigate by the waves. Oh, that one, you want to ride that one? Let's ride that one. Oh, this one, this, this one seems smaller. Let's, let's ride this wave. You'd be shipwrecked, right? So we navigate by nowadays, you know, navigation sips, uh, systems, you know, GPS. But back in the day, it was land, landmarks, right? Sometimes the stars, a compass. Why? Because to a certain extent, I mean, you can go all philosophical and say, yeah, but, but to a certain extent, those things are constant is what I'm trying to say. You can make decisions on things that are not constant. I mean, have you ever pulled up to a traffic light and you were on your phone, which you shouldn't be, but you're on your phone and then the car moved and you thought, you thought it was your car and you just sort of, why? Because, because the point of reference in like the side of your view just moved and it caused havoc in you. And when our references change, when we navigate our lives by our feelings, you will be a shipwreck. Waves are feelings. If you wake up in the morning, you feel like, what do I feel like doing today? If you're in a small group and like, you know, you don't say things like the Bible says. You say things like, you know, I feel that. Like, I, I just feel that. I'm like, how long is that feeling going to last? Because my feelings, sometimes I wake up and it's, everything's great and it's powerful. And I'm like, I want to serve the Lord. And sometimes, like, I don't want to see anyone right now. I want to just hide. Right? So we have to make things, we have to make decisions based on that which is constant. And what is constant it's not our love towards him. It's his love towards us. Every single day when I faceplant on stage or I have a great sermon, 
I'm not validated by how much I love God. I'm validated by how much he still loves me despite my brokenness, despite what I'm going through, despite my dysfunction, despite of where I came from, despite any of that. Jesus loves me. That is the constant that we navigate our lives by. Now, how, is this, how does this apply? Well, you know, there's different kinds of loves, obviously, and we don't, we don't, I think a lot of the modern day songs do a, a huge disservice because they talk about Jesus like Jesus is some kind of boyfriend. There are different kinds of love, right? Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, some people put it at seven. C.S. Lewis puts it at least four. The Greeks had at least four, and one of them is, uh, as they knew it, as storge, which is the love of the family. Parents have love towards their kids. That's storge. That's, that's kind of like a, a love that is kind of in, in family. And it has to do a lot with kind of empathy, right? Like you, you truly care about the people in your family. There's the phileo kind of love, which is the brotherly kind of love. The, the, the love that brothers and sisters in Christ have, you know, amongst each other. And then there's obviously the, the Greek word eros, which is where we get our, uh, the word erotic from, which is the romant, romantic kind of love, that is between a husband and a, and a wife, right? And then the last one you have is agape. Agape is the love of God, the way God loves us. But if we don't understand agape, we can't be functional in any of those. Why? Because if we're talking about eros, for example, the erotic kind of love, the romantic kind of love, right? The, the Bible says, love your wife the way Christ loved the church. Everything gets tied back to the agape kind of love. You can't love your brothers and sisters in Christ, the, the phileo kind of love, if you don't know agape love. As a father, as a, as a husband, as a wife, as, as a mom, you can't function in your role as that unless you understand God's love towards you. So we have to understand, how is God's love then? That's the question. Where, what, what is God's love? I, I remember the story. I don't remember exactly what I heard, but this uh, worker uh, or this, this, this girl worked for some sale supermarket or something, and they were sitting at lunch, and they started to talk about what love means. And everyone said, like, well, love to me means this, and I feel love to me means this. And, and this girl is a Christian, and she says, you know, to me, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag, and it's not arrogant. It does not act according, uh, unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Uh, does not take into account the wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never fails. And all the coworkers are like, did you write that? <laughs> and she's like, no, it's, it's, it's from a book. I'm like, what book? The Bible. That is, you know, here's a good test for you. If you want to know if you have the love of God, replace your name with love and say, is Slavic patient? Is Slavic kind? Is Slavic jealous? Slavic, <laughs> does Slavic brag about, uh, replace your, and, and, and do a test like that. That is God's love towards us. That, that's the best way I can describe, uh, describe it. God is patient. God, God is kind towards us. He, he's jealous uh, in, in the sense that like he is jealous for you not going out and destroying your life. But he's not jealous in the sense of like, you know, kind of like the, the, the jealous boyfriend kind. So God defines love this way. Now, I, I, I really wrestle with this because I'm like, I, how do I explain love? I mean, some of us spend our whole lives trying to figure it out. I haven't figured it out yet. How do we explain that? And the best way I can is just bring examples up where we see this demonstrated. Would you like an example? Okay, all right. <laughs> In the Old Testament, there's this amazing kind of love between Jonathan and David. Jonathan is the, the, king Saul, uh, the King Saul's son, which he's the prince. And David is a nobody. He's a shepherd boy. And he's brought into the king's palace because he apparently was really good at playing the harp. And, and, and he, they bring him into the palace. And Jonathan befriends David, and they have this phileo kind of love, this brotherly love. What's amazing is that 
we all kind of know the story. And for those of you who are not familiar, you have King David, uh, King Saul, which is like the first king the Israelites have. And in, even though he has so much promise as, as a king, you know, he really miserably fails at that. And he starts to become very vengeful. And then he gets really riled up when the woman of the town starts to sing, you know, Saul king, uh, killed his thousands, and David killed his ten, tens of thousands. So, so what happens here is David is brought into the king's palace, and then he kind of grows up in the palace, and, and he's working for the palace, and then he kills Goliath, and then he is this mighty warrior. And then one day, now he's threatening, in a sense, Saul, because Saul is the king, and Saul feels so threatened by David because David's going to take over his throne. And, and then when he hears these women like, like singing these songs that King Saul killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands, he gets really riled up, and he starts to persecute David. But Jonathan is loyal to David, and he loves him like his brother, even though they're not family. And he actually helps him. If you read the whole story, he helps him a lot of times just sort of try to hide David and while Saul is just raging on. But what's crazy to me is that, Jonathan, you're the prince. You're nice to David. David is going to take your spot. You are in line to be the next monarch. You are in line to be the next king. Jonathan, what are you doing? And we have this amazing passage here in uh, 1 Samuel 20, 13, where, you know, Saul wants to kill David, and Jonathan puts him kind of to a test and figures out, okay, dad wants to kill you. And he comes up to David and says, you need to hide. You need to run. But promise me that because I'm kind to you, you'll be kind to me. And look at this. 1 Samuel 20, 13 says this. If, ple if it pleases my father to do you harm, may the Lord do so to Jonathan. And more also, if I do not make it known to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. So he's saying, look, I know my dad wants to kill you, but what I want to tell you is that let the Lord punish me if I don't tell you this so you can flee to safety. So he has a commitment. He loves David. He wants to make sure that David is safe, right? He goes on to say, and may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, will you not show me the loving kindness? Now, this word loving kindness is the best word that we can describe grace. The, 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 the Hebrew word there is hesed. And it's, it's this amazing, it's not just kindness, but loving kindness. It's a person who loves and is, as, as a result of that, he is kind towards that person. He, he goes on to say, he says, Will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I might not die? You shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever. Not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. Now, do you understand? When you have a rival, uh, so, so, so David as a kid, he got anointed as a, uh, as a king. So he is rising up and he's a threat to this kingdom. So Jonathan understands that when David becomes king, I, in my household, and the household of Saul, will be his enemies. Okay, so good so far? You guys still good? All right, let's go on. It says, so Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, may the Lord require it at the hands of David's enemies. Jonathan made David vow again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own life. So you have this amazing thing that happens here where they love each other with this brotherly kind of love. And he says, I will lay my life down for you. I will put myself at risk because Saul kind of senses that Jonathan is trying to help David. Now, something really horrible hap happens where, you know, uh, uh, Saul, I don't have time to go into the whole story, but he goes and he, he kind of gets uh, some a word from this witch and, and he goes to a battlefield and this is kind of the end of Saul and they are defeated badly. And, and, and Saul is killed, Jonathan is killed in the battle. Now, 
the house of, of Saul and Jonathan get word of this. And in this pursuit, right, like when, when they're trying to kind of figure out what's happening and uh, there's a war going on and now the king is dead. The whole house to get riled up. They, they get like, okay, the next king, which most likely will be David, when he rises to power, he will come. It was the custom of the day that, that when a king rises up, he would come and kill everyone in the previous king's household. Do you understand why? Because they didn't want any kind of claim to the throne. So by now you're thinking, okay, this is a bad situation. And if you happen to be in the house of Saul, this is bad news for you. King David will send, just, just a moment of time, when King David will send someone to kill pretty much everyone. And we see this in Samuel 4, 4, 4 uh, 2 Samuel 4, 4. It says this, Now Jonathan, Saul's uh, son, had a son crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the report of Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him and fled. And it happened that in a hurry to flee, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. So in this commotion, when they hear that the king is dead, there's this five-year-old kid that's the son of Jonathan. And he survives this whole thing. But in this commotion, the nurse that is supposed to take care of this kid grabs him and drops him. And he breaks his legs. And obviously, they don't have time to sort of put his legs back together. The, 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 we know that they were able to. For some reason, they were never done. And he becomes crippled for the rest of his life. Now, this is not modern-day cripple. This is not modern-day someone, you know, has their legs broken because they can go to the hospital and put them back. No, in, in the ancient days, if you're a cripple, if you're lame, you're either cast in the street or you're just, nobody wanted to look at you because some people thought th there's a curse on you. There's no wheelchairs. None of the, the houses are where the, the palaces were, any of the kind of like the public spaces, they're never, none of them are accommodated for you. So needless to say, he is, he is in a lot of trouble. And this kid sort of grows, and, he, and they escape to this place called Lodabar. Now, Lodabar is translated as a barren land, a, a, a land with no pasture, a land where nothing grows. So he is hiding in this place now think about this he is born all good he, he physically he's all good but then he is made lame at the hand of someone else of the carelessness of someone else right he, he not only that but he's hiding in fear because if david finds out there is this kid that's in line to the throne he will come and kill me he is hiding lodabar in a place of a barren land He's in fear. Every single day, he grows up with this fear that is just one day, there's going to be a chariot on the horizon, and it's coming after me, and I will be dead. He lives in fear. And also, as we're going to see later on, he feels worthless. Needless to say, he had really low self-esteem. But here's the good news. One day, David, the king, he's powerful. He's the most powerful monarch of his time. He's, at that time, people say that he was the most powerful person in the entire world. And the king sits in his chair, and he's thinking about his whole life, and he remembers his friendship with Jonathan. He remembers the covenant with Jonathan. And he summons his kind of like servants 2 Samuel 9, and then David said, is there anyone left of the house of Saul? Now, remember, Saul is his enemy by now. That I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, there, were, uh, there was a servant of the house of um, the king. I'm sorry. There was a servant of the house and anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness of God. And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan, who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, behold, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amoniel, in Lodabar. The king said to uh, David, send and brought him 
from the house of Machir and the son of Emiel, from Lodabar. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face, prostrated himself. Now think about that. He, the thing that he dreaded his whole life, he doesn't know why the king is summoning, is calling him into his presence. He doesn't understand why he's calling him. And he's thinking, I'm dead. This is something that my whole life I was told. I'm done. So he comes before David and says, well, maybe, maybe there's some kind of grace. Maybe my life will be spared, right? And he goes on to say this. Um, verse 5 says, the king sent and brought him from the house. And verse 6, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said to Mephibosheth, and he said, here is your servant. David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you and the land of your grandfather and Saul, or grandfather Saul, and you shall eat on my table regularly. Again, the, he prostrated himself and he said, what is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? Now, to say that he has a low self-esteem, that would not do it justice. Dogs in the ancient world, you know, Jews would pray, God, thank you so much that you did make me a woman, uh, you know, a Gentile, or a dog. I know it's, it's crazy to even mention that in modern days, but let's just say they were very self-righteous about this. And they looked at dogs as Gentiles. He doesn't just look at himself as a dog. He looks at himself as a dead dog. Roadkill. Why would you show such kindness to me? And this is where this whole story leads. Of course, the story happened. It's part of history. Right? But it's also an allegory. It's, it's a story of what God has done for us. All of us are Mephibosheth. David is Jesus. Except Jesus is a better David. And in our brokenness, I don't know, maybe you grew up in brokenness. The Bible says that we are born in sin and we are shaped in iniquity. We are born with this nature to, to crave sin, to go towards sin, but also we are shaped, our environment, we live in, in families that are dysfunctional. We live in churches that at times are broken. We live in a world that is broken. The Bible says that we live in a world that, that groans under the curse of sin. That is the hope of the, of the gospel is that even though we were dead in our trespasses, God sent for us. And that's kind of like what, what the amazing thing about what God has done for us. And, and in the, the first passage I talked about how, but God in his mercy saved us. Now, what is grace? And the best acronym that I could find is this, is grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Uh, Mephibosheth was broken. Mephibosheth was slain. Mephibosheth is hiding himself in <laughs> Lodabar. But David remember his covenant with Jonathan, with his father. You see, God didn't save us because our merit, because we were worthy. God saved us because the covenant that he had with Abraham. God saved us because of the covenant with another through Jesus Christ. Now, we were enemies of God. We were like the house of Saul and the house of David. We were at odds with one another. But God, in his loving kindness, sent for us. Here's a few things I hope you remember. Is that God's love, and I hope they're on the screen, God's love does not depend on our merit. And I, know, I understand you know that. But you know how this manifests right now? Slavik, how do I minister after I just sinned? 
how do I, how do I go on after I just sin? Now, you're probably going to walk out of this place and you probably will sin. You know how you minister? Understanding that your sin doesn't make you less or more worthy. You know what's amazing? Is that David looking at Mephibosheth, he was lame. There's nothing that Mephibosheth can really contribute to the table. Imagine one day, you know, Solomon, beautiful kid, very smart, sits in one corner. And then you have Absalom with his long hair. He's sitting at the king's table. And then you have the mighty warriors of, of David. Just, you know, and then everyone's just like, there's an empty chair. And then there's this guy that gets brought in. And, and David's like, yeah. Have you ever sat at a table that you don't belong? Do you know how he feels? Last May, I was uh, at a film festival, and we were sitting at these tables, and there's this, you know, actresses, and, you know, like at this table, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, I hope they don't know that, you know, one of them is not like the other, right? Like, <laughs> like they don't look at me like, what is this guy talking about? He has no idea, and he, he, doesn't, he doesn't know anything about the industry, right? And I'm just sitting there, and I would say something, I'm like, oh, that was so stupid. Like, <laughs> why would, and then, like, I mean, have you ever been in a place where you have to eat very formally, like very with, and I'm like, I don't even know which, which hand do I take the fork and which hand do I take the, and apparently you're supposed to put that on the, ta on, on the plate when you're done. And I, I, had, I don't know any of that. And I'm just sitting there like just dumb, like thinking like, I hope they don't discover that I don't belong. Well, that's just a small thing what Mephibosheth is going through right now. Well, the amazing thing is it's not just a picture of David. It's, it's a picture of Christ. When he plucks you out of your sin, out of a place of, of, of where there's no growth, there's, everything's barren, out of a dry place, out of the desert. When he pulls you out of... You, now, now, I wish to tell you that Mephibosheth was healed and he started walking, but that's not what their story says. He was still lame the whole time he was at the king's table. He lived with that. Now, I know that God heals. I believe God heals. We pray for healing. But I've also seen where people live their whole life with a dysfunction in their body, with some kind of sickness or disease. Hey, Apostle Paul himself says, you know, Lord, I, I prayed three times to the Lord to take this, whatever that thorn in the flesh was. And God says, my mercy and my grace is sufficient. I wish to tell you that your problems will go away once you encounter Christ, but that's just not the truth. No, you're just going to go through them with Christ. There's going to be enough grace. His grace is going to be sufficient. So, you see, God's love does not depend on your merit. Now, of course, when you sin, you need to repent. If you walk with the Lord, you'll walk in repentance. But it doesn't make you more or less holy. I want to qualify that. I don't mean, of course, sin doesn't make you holy. Of course, sin doesn't make you righteous. What I want to tell you, though, is that your redemption didn't come at your effort. Your redemption came at what Christ has done on the cross. And you were washed not because you can walk better now in your lame feet. You're still lame. Now, that might be offensive to you. I'm sorry. But we all are. No. We're still lame. We're still sinful. But Christ paid the price. And we, we are invited. We are summoned into his presence. Now, I hope that when we get at this table, we don't look around like, after a few months, what is that guy doing here? He's blind. He came in, he see his food, and like it's all over the place. I hope that when you understand the grace that was extended to you, that you start extending it to everyone else at the table. I hope that as a church, as we go in towards Thanksgiving, I love how when we go out to eat, and it always happens to be like, I don't know, 10 and then 20 come, right? Like it's always a big, you know, group of people that come. And if in, it's great if they come all at once, but sometimes they come one by one. So, so you sit down, and you're like, oh, pull up a chair. That's just a, a, a thing that we say. But when then five or 10 shows up, you're like, okay, pull up a table, right? Because there's way more. I hope that we are that kind of church. That for this Thanksgiving, we're not just saying pull up a chair. We're saying, let's pull up another table. Let's include you in. 
I, I know of your brokenness. I know of your lameness, lameness but you should check out my, my, my struggle. You should look at how, where I was before Christ called me here. That's an attitude. Right? That's how we extend the kindness or the loving kindness of God. The second thing I want to say is God's love pursued us when we were broken and ashamed, and God is still pursuing us. It wasn't because we were perfect. No, in our dysfunction, God showed us grace. He pursued us. Number three, God's love gives us unmerited favor. He gives us a right to come and sit at, uh, at his table. And that kind of goes with number four, which is God's love grants us access. So first he gives us unmerited favor, but also he grants us access to himself and to his table. Hey, you know, I love that song when we sing that, you know, take me in past the outer courts into the holy of holies. Take me in by the what? By the blood of the lamb. You know, we stepped in his presence, not on our account, but on the account of Jesus Christ. Take me past the outer courts. Take me into your presence at your table. And the last one is this, is God's love secures us an inheritance. Because in verse 9 of 2 Samuel 9, verse 9, says, The king called Saul, servant Ziba, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and all his house, I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your master's grandson may have food. And nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master, right, grandson shall eat at my table regularly. So basically what happens here is that David gives everything that belonged to the house of Saul, gives it to Mephibosheth. He servants everything, gives it to Mephibosheth. God's love secures us an inheritance. Now, this is what God has done for us. How do we respond to all of this? You know, this story is not over, you know. There's a time where Absalom, the same person that sat at the table with Mephibosheth, decided that he's going to rise up an army and go up against his own father. And David, quite literally, he's getting chased out of town. And a new king's in place, at least temporarily, Absalom. And everyone that was loyal to King David runs with King David, and Ziba comes. And Ziba, which is Mephibosheth's servant, says, so David looks at Ziba and says, but where's Mephibosheth? And Ziba's like, well, Mephibosheth said that uh, finally the house of Saul gets restored back, so I'm going to stick around here. And David's just like, what are you what are you talking about? This is, this is the Mephibosheth that I took in. The Mephibosheth that sat at my table. He's like, I'll deal with him when I get back home. Now Absalom gets killed. And David starts to proceed to come into Jerusalem. And this is where we come to 2 Samuel verse 19, uh, chapter 19, verse 24. And Mephibosheth comes to meet the king. And obviously, king has a problem. The king has a problem with Mephibosheth. And look at this. Then Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. And he had neither cared for, for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came home in peace. It was when he came from Jerusalem to meet the king the king said to him, why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? So he, say, he answered, oh, my lord, the king, my servant, Ziba, deceived me. For your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself, and I might ride on it and go with the king. Because your servant is lame, moreover, he has slandered your servant to my lord, the king. But the lord, the king, is like an angel of God. Therefore... Do what is good in your sight. Do you understand what's happening here? Ziba lied. Ziba was supposed to bring a donkey for Mephibosheth to ride in because he's lame. He can't. But Ziba left him and then accused him, 
accused him. He slandered him, saying, well, yeah, Mephibosheth doesn't want to come. And Mephibosheth didn't wash himself. He says, if my king is suffering, I will suffer with him. And he comes to meet the king, right? And he says, no, Ziba lied about this. I wanted to go, but I'm lame. I can't. And he took the only donkey that I was supposed to go on. Look on, it says this, moreover, he has slandered me, your servant to my Lord, the king. But the Lord, the king, is like an angel of God. Therefore, do what is good in your sight. For all my father's household was nothing but dead to me before my Lord, the king. Yet you set your servant among those who ate at your table. What right do I have yet that I should complain anymore to the king? So the king said to him, why do you still speak of your affairs? I have decided you and Ziba shall divide the land. So David, at this point, is thinking, okay, it's your word against Ziba. I don't know who to really believe. I'm just going to give you half of the inheritance. I'm going to give half of the inheritance. Seems like fair. I guess David cannot tell who's really lying here. And he says, well, I'm just going to give you half of the inheritance, and I'm going to give Ziba. And here's where this whole sermon leads. This is where the response of Mephibosheth, he turns around and says, so the king said to him, why do you still speak of your affairs? I have decided you and Ziba shall divide the land. And Mephibosheth says this, said to the king, let him even take it all. Let him take it all. Since my lord the king has come safety to his own house. You know what he's saying here? King, I don't care. Let him... Let him take all my inheritance. I'm just glad you're back. I'm just glad that you're here, that you're back home. I think this line itself, it destroys our notions of, I came to Jesus to get whatever I want. A a Christian that encounters his grace doesn't come to the table for the things on the table. He comes to the table because of Jesus, because of the King. That is my hope, that our response, when we respond to the kindness and the favor of God, when we understand that we are saved by grace, when we understand that it was not because of our merit, when we understand that God's love is the one pursued us in our brokenness, in our places of hiding, God's love brought us to the table. Then when we sit at the table, we're not there just for the food. We're not there for inheritance. We're there because we truly love the king. And if something were to happen, and if Jesus is no longer popular, if there, then, then you can stand your ground and say, I don't care about the inheritance. I don't care about all those things. I'm just glad that my king is back when he's back. I'm going to stand by my king no matter what. And when my king's suffering, I'm going to suffer with him. When my king's out of town, I'm not going to, you know, take care of myself because I want to be in suffering with him. That is the, the hope and the story that we see here in Mephibosheth. Now, what, what, what amazes me is his response to the king. And I hope as, as a church, we take these lessons and we learn from them. Not only that, I hope that like Mephibosheth, we are aware of our brokenness, but also understand that our brokenness does not hold us from being in his presence. Also understand that when we do come in his presence, we don't look around and start criticizing the people in the church. Why is she in a worship team? Why, why, why is she playing the guitar? I know the, their past. Why should I do this? Why should I sit here right next to this person that, you know, they smell? And they they just got in. And they're acting weird. Some of you are or have been with us for maybe a week. And you have no idea how to act. act. You're like, are these people going to love me? Like, uh, do, do I say, like, should I? Can I just say this? You don't try, you don't have to learn Russian to be here. And the reason I'm saying, and I'm, I guess I'm not trying to bring that. What I'm trying to say is a lot of times I notice how people will do anything just to prove that I'm acceptable and worthy of your time. They'll either speak Russian to you. I'm like, I don't need to speak Russian. Why? Like, because well, I learned that. Well, maybe you're excited about learning. 
Just be yourself. Obviously, the Holy Spirit will start already working in you because otherwise you wouldn't be here. You're accepted here. A lot of people ask us, well, you guys trust a whole bunch of people that have a past because Christ gave us a second chance. Pastor Yuri's vision, we, we talk a lot about this, is that we are a church of second chances. The good news is that, you see, when you were born, God has made you in his image. Just like Mephibosheth was part of the royal court. But there was a fall. There was a break. And when Adam and Eve sinned, the whole universe became under the groaning. We're experiencing the, the disease, the sadness, the crying. The, all of those things are the result of sin. But in our brokenness, God sent for you and for me. He said, hey, you, you belong here. Come to my table. And as we go in towards Christmas and Thanksgiving, I hope we take what Christ has done for us and we embrace his grace, but then we extend his grace. That we don't pull up just chairs, we pull tables and make our table even bigger. Make a table that, stay away from square tables, just as a side note, have a round table. Because at a round table, everyone feels the same. Nobody's at the head of the table and nobody's at the back of the table. It's, everyone is just, but pull other tables closer, make bigger circles. Amen, so I'm gonna ask you, and I wanna pray for you, and, but I'm gonna ask you this. Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you been hiding? If you have not made Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, can I tell you that he sent me this morning for you? And maybe you thought, oh, is this guy, guy gonna judge me? No, I'm a messenger of good news. He sent me to bring you into his family, to eat at his table. 